I spent the bulk of my uh, political career on Capitol Hill, and I've seen a lot of movements come and go with little more than energy and talking points. So I think it's very important for national conservatives to think very carefully and concretely about policy. And I'm going to frame my remarks that way. But I think even more important than policy, especially in this moment, is to understand where policy comes from. Conservatism, properly understood, is actually not a set of legislative goals, like lowering taxes, school choice, or even securing the border. It's a set of principles or goods, the things Russell Kirk called the permanent things, like family, opportunity, order, freedom, and faith. Conservatives enter the political arena with our eyes wide open, fully aware that these goods are often in tension with one another. And that's why different times and circumstances call for different prioritization of these goods. So conservatism in that mindset then is always young, always evolving. Its unchanging principles always supple enough to be reapplied to each new era and challenge. But people with eyes wide open must be able to see new challenges when they arise. And I think national conservatism has arisen in part out of that foresight, in direct contrast to an institutional conservative movement that is clinging to old assumptions about left and right politics, which have spawned solutions that once worked, but are now woefully inadequate to address our present peril. I'm talking about the Reagan coalition, loosely described as the political coalition between social conservatives, defense hawks, and economic libertarians. National conservatives understand what many of DC's conservative institutions do not, and that is that the Reagan coalition is dead. Apologies to Dan Oliver, who I saw in the room earlier. <laughs> In Reagan's time, the great threats to America and the West were the expansion of Soviet communism and the strangulation of the entrepreneurial economy by top-down federal policies. But today, the Soviet Union and the 70% income tax rate are history. The fatal hubris of much of DC's conservative intellectuals is to treat the coalition and the policies it spawned as if they are still vital and alive, to take what was temporal and treat it as though it were eternal. If we are to move forward as a movement, we must confidently move on from the specific priorities Reagan advanced and toward a more sophisticated understanding of the new threats which have arisen. One threat in particular, which we've heard a lot about recently, the elite's cult of wokeness, today represents a greater danger to the permanent things, to the American way of life, than any of the problems still Reaganite Washington Republicans prioritize. Consider, in a moment where almost trillion dollar corporations wield the power to silence dissent, when colleges and universities subordinate fact and truth to politics, when school boards, and apparently as of yesterday, the libertarians at Reason Magazine, cover up sexual assaults in girls' bathrooms to hide the predator's gender identity, when generals, while losing yet another war, conspire with political activists to subvert civilian control of the military. And when public health officials lie to the country about secretly financing illegal bioweapon experiments that turn into a global pandemic, when all of this is sitting at our doorstep, the capital gains tax rate doesn't matter all that much. The power and ambition of this country's elite class really is an existential threat to the future of our nation. They hate us. They hate America. They hate the values of the Constitution and the power it vests in we the people whom they view with sneering contempt. This is what Republican establishment and leading conservative institutions fail to understand about this moment and this fight. They pretend conservatives and progressives still want the same things and just disagree about how to achieve them. But the woke elites, which increasingly represent the mainstream left of this country, they don't want what we want. What they want is to destroy us. 
And not only will they use every power at their disposal to achieve that goal, they have been for years by dominating every cultural, intellectual, and political institution the right made a choice to abandon. They have done this without hesitation and they have not had to pass a single law to do it. But it's important to unpack what elite wokeness really represents. Its proponents smugly present themselves as representing an emerging coalition of the ascendant. But in reality, this is a lie. It's just an old boys club. It's another frat house for entitled rich kids contrived to perpetuate their unearned privilege. It's literally skull and bones for gender studies majors, okay? <laughs> for all its gooey rhetoric and high-minded rationalizations, at bottom, Wokeism exists solely to insulate entitled mediocrities from accountability for the relentless disasters that have fallen this country under their incompetent leadership. That's all it is. And it's this innate insincerity of wokeness that makes it so dangerous. It has no principle, okay? There is no principle that is being advanced here, just their own material interests and their sense of superiority over uppity commoners who dare to question their anointed status. It's a totalitarian cult of billionaires and bureaucrats, of privilege perpetuated by bullying, empowered by the most sophisticated surveillance and communication technologies in history, and limited only by the scruples of people who arrest rape victims' fathers, declare math to be white supremacist, finance ethnic cleansing in Western China, and who all partied a mile high on Jeffrey Epstein's Lolita Express. Failure to appreciate the power and amorality and lack of principle of the woke elite should be seen as a disqualifying flaw in anyone that seeks to lead our communities, our institutions, and our country. Giving the elite any benefit of the doubt or waiting on the free market or a Republican judge to save us is indistinguishable from surrender. That is why, however popular Reaganism was in the 1980s, conservatism must move on from its priorities. They were right for his time. They are wrong for ours. And priorities is the correct word here. In the 1980s, America needed more economic dynamism and global assertiveness. Today, we need other things more. National conservatives don't have to repudiate or transcend traditional conservative principles. We simply have to reorder them. This approach is not a repudiation of conservatism. Reprioritization of principles to meet changing times is what conservatism is. The first step in this challenge is dropping forever the false narrative that America is split down the ideological middle and that Republicans should focus only on turning out our base to win 50-50 elections. National conservatives can and should aim much higher. Just consider the groups that the elites have already alienated or outright canceled. Black, white, Latino, and Asian Americans who know wokeism is fundamentally racist. Jewish Americans who know it's anti-Semitic. Mothers who know it's misogynistic. Parents who know it hates their kids. Churchgoers who know it hates God. First generation Americans and blue collar workers who know it is fundamentally elitist and exploitative. This isn't anyone's silent majority. These guys are loud, ticked off, and sick of being treated like second-class citizens by performance artists who pretend riots are peaceful, that men can get pregnant, and that Saturday Night Live is still funny. <laughs> but just because America's broad and diverse and proud middle class has been betrayed by the elites doesn't mean they have any reason to trust Republicans either. So this is our second step. Rather than hoping for all these potential new voters to turn to us in some future election, we need to turn to them now. If we really believe the country is facing an existential threat, as I do, then we have to be able to work and communicate and govern creatively to forge a national coalition to defy, defund, and defeat the cult of wokeness from Capitol Hill to Harvard Yard to Silicon Valley. Finally, step three is to figure out what national conservatives would actually do with a mandate to lead? What should our priorities look like? And first, let me say this. Whatever our policy goals, they should, to a great extent, be passed by the Congress. Not temporary tweaks by the administrative state, which can be undone. 
not court rulings by yet another unelected judge, however good they may be. For all its shortcomings, the heart of our federal system is and will always be the Congress, the branch with the truest imprimatur of the people. It currently finds itself weak and feckless, and undoing that is a central part of strengthening both our movement and the country. But the primary work of national conservatives must be to rescue the American people from the unearned, unaccountable power that the woke elites wield over them. And putting the authority of running this country back into the hands of the sovereign individuals, families, and communities to whom it belongs. The first thing we do, we kill all the monopolies. <laughs> the big tech corporations in particular, not exclusive to them, but in particular, must be broken up period, full stop. <laughs> now, spare me the platitudes about consumer choice or the pearl clutching about needing our own anti-American mega corporations to compete with China. Silicon Valley has had decades to prove themselves corporate patriots, and they are obviously content to be the opposite. Businesses like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple exert state-like monopoly control over America's minds and markets, and they simply cannot be allowed to endure. The scale at which they exist is incompatible with a free society. In America, we integrate innovation into our values and traditions. We do not sit around and wait to be reformed in the image dictated to us by megacorporations. Second, we must extricate the United States from multilateral institutions and trade agreements that hand over our sovereignty to anti-American globalist apparatchiks. In the UN, in the WTO, in the WHO, and others, America is just one of several voting members. We don't wait around in America to submit to the diktat of some globalist organization whose members hate us. We want out, and bilateral trade agreements should be the wave of the future. Domestically, national conservatives should focus on family and community formation as intensely as we ever focused on business and market formation. 40% of America's children today are born out of wedlock. 70% of black children. Everyone knows the intergenerational damage this does to families and to neighborhoods, to moms and their kids, and especially to young black men. And let's be very clear. The woke elite in this country do not care. Federal social policy is written almost exclusively by rich, white, progressive elites who attended the right schools, watched the right Netflix comedy specials, and parked their hybrid cars next to their Black Lives Matter signs. But their true values are expressed in the laws that intentionally punish young, low-income couples for, have, for having kids, getting married, and getting jobs. That is, for doing the things that would help them rise in America and maybe challenge the elite's privileged status one day. Never forget that. Intergenerational poverty is good for America's elite and their kids. Remember that the next time they dismiss welfare work requirements. Those same policymakers and their woke capital donors also write America's immigration laws with the prime objective of delivering to corporate America cheap, powerless immigrant labor to indemnify themselves from having to pay decent wages to actual American citizens, be they black, white, brown, or rainbow colored. It is a sin what America's elite has done to low-income Americans for the last three generations. National conservatism, if it means anything, must mean emancipating workers, um, of, uh, American workers of every race from the high-tech overseers that are keeping them down. In this toxic environment, national conservative priorities can be very simple. Every child in America, born and unborn, deserves to grow up with both parents, married, rooted in a safe, bonded neighborhood where mom can choose her own work-life balance and dad can support his family with a job that Wall Street, K Street, and Pennsylvania Avenue can't give away to China. With that as our vision, the agenda writes itself, seal the border, deport the illegal immigrants and prosecute businesses who exploit them, break up the big tech monopolies, and while we're at it, break up the big banks too. Bring the critical supply chains home and upend the multilateral trade deals and institutions. End both abortion and the laws and tolerance for deadbeat dads. End federal marriage penalties, parent penalties, and work disincentives. 
Cut the Gordian knot woke elites have tied around education policy. For crying out loud, get the masks off the preschoolers. Get critical race theory out of our classrooms and ask the campus socialists where they would like us to redistribute their university's endowments. <laughs> These fights won't be easy, and to truly engage them requires some relinquishing of Buckley's old adage that conservatives must stand athwart history yelling stop. A movement dedicated simply to digging trenches is no longer acceptable, nor is it adequate. This new threat, the global woke elite have proven they will tyrannize every election, every policy, every institution, every family, and every inch of our souls if we let them. To fight this effectively requires us to fix our bayonets and walk right into it. No longer can we cling to ideological trees while the entire forest burns. We have to use our wits and our self-government to actively cut down the forces of decay that seek to destroy every meaningful and beautiful tradition our countrymen have died to defend. Our courage is what is now required and our duty to the ancient bonds that exist between the dead, the living, and the yet to be born demands that we now give our full measure. Thank you.